we move on to college lecture and it is again a privilege to have Dr. Samir Mohideen. Uh, Samir again and I have worked in the same ward for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, I think I first met Samir in 2008 when I did a college lecture like this uh, for the Ceylon College of Physicians and I met Samir when he was yet a medical student. So roles have reversed today. Samir is lecturing, I'm listening. And to introduce Samir uh, informally, may I invite Dr. Gamini Patrana, who is the uh, immediate past president of the Association of Neurologists of Sri Lanka. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Arusha. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, Arusha, for inviting uh, ASN to co-chair in this session. I am uh, chairing this on behalf of the president, ASN, uh, Dr. Darshan Sirisin, unable to participate today. Uh, let me introduce the next speaker, Dr. Mohammed Sami Mohideen. Uh, he is uh, 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 he has his schooling in. Uh, uh, Preston Park Primary UK and then Richmond College Ball. And uh, he has his undergraduate education at University of Science and Technology, Chittagong Institute of uh, Applied Health Sciences, Bangladesh. He had his MBBS in 2010 and MD, Colombo, in April 2017, and his MRCP UK in November 2018. Uh, uh, he had awards. Uh, uh, Distinction in Anatomy and Biochemistry in the MBBS. He's currently working as Acting Consultant Neurologist at National Hospital. Uh, he's actually working with me at the moment. He had it foreign training at King's College Hospital London. He used to talk about unusual things. So he's going to talk to us today on unusual headaches. Over to you, Samir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the kind words of introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Arush Dishanayake and the CCP for inviting me for this lecture. Right, let me share the screen. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Yes. I can see, okay. So I'm going to go from uh, power plays to uh, uh, super overs because I have to, within 30 minutes, uh, talk about multiple unusual headache syndromes. Uh, and. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the most important part of the body, the brain, which causes headaches, right? So unusual headaches, so these are going to be my talks. Again, you see, if you can uh, guess the diagnosis by looking at the image, you know already about these unusual headaches. It's not unusual to you. And so you can see a person with the ice cream holding onto the chin, uh, the book by Lewis Carroll, uh, this one, Alice in Wonderland, you can see a coin, you can see snow, leaks, explosions, and handles. So these are my unusual headache syndromes. Uh, let's uh, 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 syndromes. In addition, I just talk about a little introduction about a common um, migraine and the world uh, disabilities associated with migraine. So we look at all out of all the uh, neurological disorders. As you know, stroke is the commonest uh, neurological disorder seen worldwide. But uh, surprisingly, migraines come second, and tension type headaches comes within the first ten as well. These are all primary headaches, which we see quite often. In addition to this, we see secondary headaches in meningitis, encephalitis, brain injury. These are all secondary headaches. And if you look at disability caused by migraines, and the migraines are shown here in green and light green, the tension headache, it causes significant proportion of disability compared to any other neurological disorder. So how good are physicians in diagnosing migraine? Well, the good news is physicians diagnose a migraine 90% of the time is correct. But with good news, you have bad news as well. Physicians non-migraine diagnosis, 82% is incorrect. So uh, this is a small trial uh, study done. This is not generalized into all physicians, but this is generally uh, the, uh, uh, the data from the small trial. So that's why I'm going to talk about non-migraine headaches or rare complications of migraine or unusual headaches. To diagnose unusual headaches, we need to know the red flag signs of headaches. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a mnemonic called SNOOP4. So you ask in all patients when you're suspicious of an unusual headache, whether the first S stands for systemic symptoms, can have secondary causes, or do they have neurological symptoms and signs, whether the onset is thunderclap. Sometimes people mistake thunderclap is zero to maximum intensity within the first minute. 
uh, and it's the maximum or the most severe headache ever felt by the patient. The age more than 60, positional, very important. If, the pos if there's a headache worsening on standing, it could be a low pressure headache. If the position worsening on lying down, maybe raised intracranial pressure. Or if there's papilledema, or has the headache changed from usual migraine headache? Has it changed to a significantly different headache? Or is it during pregnancy or postpartum? Or is it precipitated by valsalva? So coming to the unusual headache syndrome, the three types I'll talk, be talking about is the unusual presentation of a primary headache disorder, unusual headache secondary disorder, or a headache disorder, which are not headache syndromes at all. So first one is Alice in Wonderland syndrome. I'm sure uh, all of you uh, uh, have read the book by Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland. Did anyone know the inspiration behind Lewis Carroll's uh, uh, book? They think, uh, uh, based on this image he has drawn in one of his other books, you could see a man uh, uh, with the left hand, the left shoulder, left side of his face is slightly blurred or not seen. They feel this is actually a Lewis Carroll uh, describing or uh, drawing his own scotoma during a migraine episode. Uh, even though this is uh, this is debated whether he actually had migraine or not. So the question is whether his migraines were the reasons he wrote about Alice in Wonderland or whether Alice in Wonderland syndrome was related to his migraine with auras. And if you look at the uh, 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 Alice in Wonderland, this is a study in children had shown there are so many unusual medic, head, uh, migraine complications of presentations. Alice in Wonderland syndrome is a very recognized, unusual presentation of migraine. So what happens with Alice in, migraine, uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland syndrome? So as we know, Alice uh, in this book uh, follows a rabbit down the rabbit hole. And then he, when, when he comes up, he uh, uh, drinks from a bottle and suddenly Alice suddenly uh, shrinks in size. Then afterwards, after some time, she eats the cake and she becomes big. So in Alice in Wonderland syndrome, there are visual distortions. Sometimes you call it, this is called teleopsia, where you see things close by appears far away. Pelopsia is you see things which are far away, too close to yourself. Or you have kinetopsia, where things around your surrounding moves around. And the classical Alice in Wonderland syndrome has macropsia, where you see Individuals larger than what you should see. Micropsia, smaller. Or you could have even distortion of the whole or part of the body. And interestingly, you lose perception of time uh, when you have Alice in Wonderland syndrome. And there are other miscellaneous uh, symptoms associated with this as well. So this is the classical where Alice has shrunk in size. We call it micropsia. And the next one, Alice has grown in size after eating the cake. She's almost, almost hitting her head on the ceiling. This is macropsia. So what is Alice in Wonderland syndrome? It's a rare migraine aura, generally described. So as I said, it has micropsia, macropsia, distortion, teleopsia, pelopsia, and kinetopsia uh, in its syndrome. So the question is, where is it localized to? Generally, they believe this is a non-dominant temporal parietal lobe localization where the symptoms and signs start from. Question is, is it all migraine? Answer is no. Because Alice in Wonderland syndrome can be seen in other conditions in addition to migraine as well. Classically, we treat migraine with topiramate. And topiramate used for migraine can cause Alice in Wonderland syndrome as well. In addition, epilepsy, infection, toxic encephalopathies, and the stroke involved in the right temporal lobe can present with Alice in Wonderland syndrome. Maybe this is a good opportunity to start reading or there's a movie, Alice in Wonderland, uh, to understand the rare presentation of uh, a migraine aura. Then I come to uh, the second syndrome. Can you see snowflakes? You see snow. So as that uh, images show, the next syndrome is visual snow syndrome. Uh, interesting thing about visual snow syndrome is a continuous visual disturbance that occupies the entire visual field. That's very important. And if you remember uh, looking, um, watching old uh, uh, televisions, when it's detuned, you get this black flickering dots like you can see in this. So it's visual snow syndrome. It appears like this. I'm not sure. I think we are all old enough to have uh, seen a television this old. And so how would you see it? And previously, this was described as persistent positive visual phenomena because it is there throughout 
the day throughout for a period of time and it does not disappear. And this can be mimicked by taking hallucinogens, especially if there's cocaine, amphetamines, this can mimic uh, visual snow syndrome. So this is the visual snow syndrome where if you're, on the left-hand side would be normal vision. On the right-hand side, showing if you have visual snow syndrome, it looks a little blurry, tiny dots in its uh, side. But in addition to this tiny dot reappearance, you have other features of visual snow syndrome as well. One is palinopsia. That means you see an after image after the first image. So sometimes we might say, oh, uh, uh, patients might say, oh, you can see the image after the image has already disappeared. So that's called palinopsia. So you can see this is drawn by a young child who had issue snow syndrome. She has drawn the house uh, with a slightly grayish tinge on the background again. And the tree again, she can, she's drawn another image. This is how she sees her after image of palinopsia. In addition to palinopsia, you see a thing called enhanced entropic phenomena. That is on a blue nice background or a blue sunny day, you can see floaters in front of your eyes. So this is another feature of visual snow syndrome. In addition to this, you have photophobia, you have dictolopia as well. You have impaired vision in the night. So the question is, isn't visual snow syndrome and migraine aura the same thing? No, why? Visual snow syndrome, it is unremitting, continuous in character. If it's migraine, it's transient. Generally, migraine aura would last between five to 60 minutes. And in visual snow, field, uh, visual snow syndrome, it involves the whole of your visual field, not just one side, maybe the right-hand side or the left. But in migraine aura, it's generally specified, specific to one visual field. And the pathophysiology of visual snow, they feel, even though still not fully described, is an interpretation of, of the visual stimulus. So it's a more of a cortical interpretation of visual stimulus that you get. But in migraine aura, we know it's the cortical spreading depression, which causes the features of migraine with aura. Hopefully we can uh, uh, diagnose more visual snow syndrome because we know more about it now. Right, the third uh, syndrome, I know you can see a handle here, as the image shows handle, the third syndrome is actually handle syndrome. So this is a condition as the name sounds, HA for the headache, ND for the neurological deficit, L for the lymphocytic cells you see in the cerebrospinal fluid. So in handle, the headache is almost like a migraine headache, moderate to severe, throbbing, can be unilateral, maybe bilateral, duration can last one hour to one week, it's a little longer than migraines, and the headache is followed by these neurological symptoms. And the neurological deficits are more related to weaknesses, sensory disturbances, Speech issues classically be more aphasia, and the visual symptoms are less common. And if you do a lumbar puncture in these individuals, you'll see lymphocytic pleocytosis. Actually, the cells are quite in high number. You might think, okay, this looks like a highly cellular infective or a chronic inflammatory kind of uh, CSF report showing cells up to 750 cells. And the CSF proteins, the ones I have seen, are go goes beyond 100 milligrams per deciliter, quite a high protein. It looks like a TV kind of picture but the CSF sugar is normal, cytology is normal, and there's no other features of infection or chronic infection going on. So someone can ask, is handle the same as migraine with aura or prolonged aura? Well, in migraine with aura, the visual, sim visual aura symptoms are the most common feature. You have more than 90% will have visual symptoms rather than anything else. But you can have sensory language and motor symptoms. And the classical language symptoms in Migraine with aura is word finding difficulty rather than aphasia. And when you do have these other features of sensory language or motor symptoms, it is commonly associated with visual symptoms and it is a classical migraine. And generally we know migraine with aura should last between five to 60 minutes. So if it's more than 60 minutes, you have to be worried whether there's a migraine with prolonged aura or it has gone into migraine as infarction. So someone can ask, why is it different from handle? So as I said, handle, the generally the neurological deficits last more than four hours. And hemiparesthesia, dysphasia, hemiparesis, the more common presenting neurological deficit. Visual symptoms are less, and obviously the CSF lymphocytosis, lymphocytic pleocytosis is present. Interestingly, Hadden is described as a monophasic illness, but recent reports have shown it can represent many months or years later as well. 
someone can ask whether why this is not a stroke, like a migraine is infarction. Well, if you do an MRI with PWI, you would see no diffusion restriction in cases of handle. Most important thing is treatment-wise, you treat the headache with symptomatic treatment and you reassure the patient, this is a mono, uh, you might less likely to get another episode and this is not a sinister cause or an underlying malignancy or any infection going on, just causing this syndrome. Right. The third and my most interesting uh, headache syndrome is leaks. You can see a leaky uh, uh, leak going on in this uh, tube here. And when you see leaks, first thing some people mistake is when you see this, oh, this is a subdural hemorrhage. Yes, it looks like a subdural hemorrhage and it is a subdural there's collection of fluid. But not all subdural hemorrhage appearances are due to a direct trauma or direct leakage of uh, uh, blood in the subdural space. So remember, low pressure headache or sub, uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension can present like bilateral subdural hemorrhages. And especially if you see a young gentleman, not on anticoagulation, who is a little tall, who has got a little marfanoid body habitus, think if you see a bilateral subdural hemorrhage looking like CT scan on MRI, whether this could be due to a spontaneous intracranial hypertension causing the leak. So interestingly, spontaneous intracranial hypertension, the word spontaneous, even though it says spontaneous, sometimes there is a precipitant factor. For example, there might have been a, a neck trauma or a back accident causing a leak long time ago. When the symptoms are intracranial, but actually the cause of the intracranial pathologies, a leak somewhere is classically in the cervical or the thoracic region and rarely in the lumbar, path, lumbar region. And even though it's called hypotension, if you do a CSF manometry, not all, most of the time you might get a low pressure, but not all the time. You can have normal pressure in the CSF manometry with low pressure headache symptoms. So the most, there are different types of leaks. And the commonest type is you get a meningeal diverticulum, which can cause the leak, or the dural tears, classically a small bone spur in the back of the uh, vertebra can cause a small puncture in the dura and causes leak. And a CSF venous fistula, even though very uncommon, can cause leaks. The question is, what is the most important symptom you need to ask for? Most important symptom, as I said, in asking for secondary headache, ask postural headache. If you have orthostatic headache, classically, if you stand up, if the headache is worse, and if you lie down, the headache disappears, think of low pressure headache. Think of this could be spontaneous intracranial hypertension. There is a barrage of a lot of other symptoms which can come in spontaneous intracranial hypertension, not directly related to headache. But interestingly, in addition, you can get movement disorders. You can have cognitive symptoms. Some patients can present even with dementia or Parkinson disease. And if you have features of low pressure headache on low pressure headache on your scans, think of possible spontaneous intracranial hypertension. Because these are reversible and correctable. So I will explain to you how the imaging works in spontaneous intracranial hypertension. We know the skull is a rigid structure. We have the brain, the CSF, and the blood within it. When you have um, a leak somewhere else, you know you lose CSF. When you lose CSF, this, based on the Monroe Kelly hypothesis, you need to compensate the space. The blood volume compensate by increasing the blood volume. The brain volume stays the same. So what happens when the blood volume increases? When the blood volume increases, that's venous congestion. So this venous congestion goes to the blood vessels where the more, there's a more, lot of vascularity, classically the meninges. So you can get meningeal, pachymeningeal enhancement. Some people, and then you can get pituitary engorgement. You can get engorgement of the vessels with the cerebral venous sinuses. In addition, you can get subdural fluid collection as well. And if the leak is significant, and if the brain starts sinking, you can get tonsillar descent, and you can get uh, brain herniation as well. So this is the classical, uh, one of the classical imaging findings of spontaneous intracranial hypertension, which can be uh, wrongly diagnosed as meningitis or chronic meningitis. If we look, because of this um, pachymeningeal blood vessels becoming tortuous, distended, you can get pachymeningeal enhancement of the brain. And as you see, because there are venous distension, the veins look very distended. And generally from the triangular shape of a venous sinus, it goes to a circular or an oval shape. 
And the pituitary, if you get a pituitary engorgement, again, think that this could be due to low pressure headache. And unfortunately, if the pr low pressure headache is diagnosed late, you can have herniation of the brain and can cause tonsillitis descent as well. So in this, you can see the brain stem looks distorted. You can't identify a proper midbrain, the brain pons, and the tonsillar descent. And sometimes you get reports where the report is anachary malformation type 1 or type 2. And you think, oh, that may be the cause of the headache. Actually, that is the sub that is a consequence of the low pressure headache rather than the direct reason for the uh, low pressure headache this gentleman would have. So after diagnosed low pressure headache, again, another image showing the distortion of the midbrain. And this shows the commonest features. The diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement seems to be the most commonest finding, followed by venous engorgement and brain sagging. And even though subdural collections are not common, it is well seen in low pressure headaches. So, if, and this is a, um, the, a new syndrome. Um, if you have a low pressure headache with uh, movement disorder or cognitive symptoms, you call it frontotemporal brain sagging syndrome. And this is correctable form of dementia. So it's important to make sure you are not missing low pressure um, uh, leak causing these symptoms. So if you get a low pressure headache, what do you do? Uh, well, you don't need to always find out where the leak is. If you do not know the leak, you do do blind blood patches. You can do two blind blood patches, but still, if there is no identified improvement or, and the conservative management has failed, you need to find the exact site of the leak. The first step in our setting would be due to a CT myelogram. And if that does not be work, we have to consider doing a thing called a dynamic CT myelogram or a DSM myelogram. Unfortunately, it's still not available in Sri Lanka and it's not. Um, widely used in other countries as well. And of course, if you identify the proper site of the leak, you could do a targeted blood patch. And if you find in a, to the leak, the reason is a fistula, you'll have to do a surgical repair. So that's all about low pressure headache. Next one is um, the, uh, the index finger on the chin. So this is an interesting syndrome. I call it numb chin syndrome. How often have we all ignored a numb chin? I think we all would have said, okay, uh, this patient got numb chin, just forget it, it's something to do with the dental cavity or some problem with the tooth. Yes, generally a numb chin syndrome, if there is, if there's following a dental procedure or some trauma, most likely it is your problem because of that event. But if you have no event and you have numb chin involving anesthesia in one, the, one side of the lip, uh, gingiva or the lower chin, Think of Numsin syndrome, and this is commonly due to the mental nerve or the uh, inferior alveolar nerve involved. Why is it important? Because Numsin syndrome without apparent cause should be assumed to have malignant etiology until proven otherwise. So the first case of Numsin syndrome was described in a patient with breast cancer, incidentally coming with Numsin and retrospectively diagnosing a breast cancer. So if you find Numsin syndrome, make sure you have looked for malignancy, especially secondary malignancy somewhere else. And you need to do an MRI scan along the whole of the trigeminal nerve and branches extending up to the face and the mandible. If not, you will miss this syndrome and you will miss the underlying etiology causing this syndrome. Right. So you need to look for secondary underlying malignancies as well. Right, my third syndrome I'll be talking of, I mean, fourth syndrome, I think I'm gonna talk about explosions. I think uh, we might have all come across this and got worried. So, sadly, a uh, patient wakes up in the middle of the night saying, doctor, doctor, I've heard, I woke up from with a sudden explosion or gunshots hearing or thunder, other loud noises, but actually there are no noises. If you ask the partner, and they say, no, no, doctor, we have not heard anything. But the patient would say, oh, no, I got up with the sudden here, sounds of this explosion. I'm very terrified. But if you had actually we really asked, there is no headache associated with this. So this is actually a sleep syndrome rather than a headache syndrome. Where there's no real headache, patient gets very alarmed and comes with this headache. And sometimes it is misdiagnosed as thunderclap headache. That's an important ask whether actually there's headache associated with this. And because this is a occurs during sleep, and this occurs in early part of sleep, uh, this is under the under a sleep disorder rather than headache disorder. 
So because of these symptoms, patients are generally worried. Uh, they get tachycardic, they have sweating, and sometimes they describe enough flashy lights and visual phenomena. Some people think this might even precipitate migraines as well. Real, you can have these myotonic jerks. And these uh, episodes are very short last, lasting less than one second. And frequency can be variable. And generally females are affected more than males. And this is in the middle age group. So the reason for exploding head syndrome is, they say when you transit from wakefulness to sleep, your reticular formation goes to sleep as well. But if there is a delayed inhibition of this reticular formation during this sleep wake transitions, you tend to get this exploding head syndrome. Why is it important to diagnose this? It's a benign condition. Reassurance is the most important thing. Why do you keep on imagining for every event of explosions, sounds they hear, you might end up doing multiple imaging. Then my last few uh, headache syndromes are one with a coin. I wish, I think we all wish we had at least these two pound coins in Sri Lanka at this moment, called nimula headache. These are coin-shaped headaches. Uh, where the patient would describe headaches in the size of a like a two rupee coin or at least 10 rupee coin in one part of the head, classically involving the parietal region. And remember, this is again mild to moderate intensity headache. And they say it's always occurring in one side. Some people uh, mistakenly diagnose this primary stabbing headache, but stabbing headache is generally more of a stab and it can occur throughout the side. It can go from left to right. This is generally uh, uh, confined to one side of the head. And again, this can be related to a metastatic or infection involving the cranial bones. And treatment is generally gabapentin, but if it's resistant, we might have to give botulinum injection uh, to treat it. So sometimes it is uh, the cases we have seen uh, sometimes can become refractory most of the headache treatment. Uh, I think this is the, my last headache. If you can see, this is the neck and tongue syndrome. As you can see, uh, Someone could ask, how would the how would a neck and tongue be related together? Well, in this neck and tongue syndrome, you get a unilateral occipital headache uh, with associated numbness of the same side of the tongue. It would last just less than one minute, common less than five minutes, and it occurs when you move your head side to side. Classically, no no direction. So when you do a yes yes movement of the neck, you might not get that syndrome, but you move head laterally, no, no, there's a high chance you might get this syndrome in patients who are predisposed. The pathophysiologists, they feel is the uh, atlanto axial joint. Uh, the adhesive capsule is a little loose. And commonly this occurs in patients with ankylosis spondylitis or previous neck trauma or who have got connective tissue disorders, got a slightly lax uh, atlanto axial joint. And when this lax atlanto axial joint moves when you move, rotate the head, you can stretch the cervical second nerve. So what's the cervical second nerve got to do with the numbness num num of the tongue? Well, the lingual nerve carries the uh, proprioceptive fibers of the tongue through the hypoglossal nerve to the second cervical um, root in the spinal cord. That's why when you move your neck, you're, you can get this neck tongue syndrome. Again, very rare, but can be seen. So important thing is to know there is a syndrome like this to uh, identify and investigate. Generally, treatment is initially physiotherapy. And if there's an underlying reason like ankylosis spondylitis, which can be corrected, might need a correction. So these are my headaches. I have uh, dropped out the ice cream headache because of time. Uh, Namchin syndrome, Alice in Wonderland, the coin shape headache or the Nimula syndrome, visual snow, low pressure headaches, the exploding head syndrome and handle. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, listening to this unusual headache syndromes and happy to take questions if there's any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samir, for that excellent talk on unusual headache syndrome. Uh, I will open for discussion questions from the audience. This is Arosh. Uh, there are two questions in the chat box because this is a webinar. Uh, the uh, attendees will have to type in their questions. Uh, Gami, if you can just look into the chat box or shall I read the questions or two questions out? Uh, first yeah. question is, what is the nature of the headache in visual snow syndrome one? 
second one is sir what are the indications for imaging in migraine headache migraine headache yeah first question what is the nature of the headache in visual snow yes so generally visual snow syndrome is a mimic of migraine with aura generally you do not get headaches it's just the continuous flickering nature of the vision of your whole of your uh, uh, pan vision which mimics migraine so we, we would say this is migraine with aura so generally not a common headache syndrome per se but it's a mimic of migraine with aura then the second question is what are the indication of imaging migraine is headache yes so generally if it's a pure and simple migraine you do not need to image however if you have certain condition for example a prolonged migraine generally migraine with aura would last generally 5 minutes to 6 uh, 60 minutes but if the migraine goes on and on the concern is the aura goes on and on with numbness or weakness lasting more than this one hour whether it is a prolonged migraine or whether this migraine is infarction so differentiate the two migraine is infarction versus migraine with prolonged aura you need to do mri with diffusion restriction to look for if there's any migraine is infarction so unless that generally we would not need to do um, imaging for pure and simple migraine obviously if there's atypical features if the headache has changed character changing a different type of headache then you might need to consider otherwise generally for normal migraine is headache imaging is not indicated i think that's all the questions sir uh... right uh, then on behalf of the silon college of physicians i wish to thank uh, <clears throat> all three speakers to date the toast to at the young specialist uh, young physicians forum doctors asiri dr gatika as well as our physician colleague uh, dr sami mohidin for for giving the erudite talks and answering all the questions so clearly with clarity i'm grateful to three speakers i'm also grateful to the Sri association of sri lankan neurologists uh, both president and the immediate past president and the association for being involved in this and then supporting us as well as uh, i wish to inform the audience that there will be the specialty update which will have about four neurology talks that will be happening was the latter part of the month as well as there will be a cutting edge lecture that is we will have an overseas expert who is talk about some something very current that will also happen towards the latter part of end so please keep an eye out for all our information uh, <coughs> brochures and and web notices so uh, my, uh, thank my thanks go to the association then of course nalina and impress team for excellent webcasting of this program the ccp staff for preparing everything making all arrangements i'm grateful to all of you let's meet very soon and as you all know ccp is not only catering to the left hemisphere of the brain we are catering to the right hemisphere of the brain as well so we will be having a, <clears throat> a couple of be one beyond medicine program within about a week again you will see the notices that will be on drama music in sri lanka and then we will have something called the pearls of wisdom where we get a very senior colleague uh, uh, physician or see uh, somebody from the ccp maybe a past president to speak to us about their life experiences and what we as the you know junior colleagues can learn from there them so that will be again uh, that will be dr anula vijay sundara will be speaking uh, next week so all those notices will be out and then please join all those programs because now that we've been given the afford at the advantage of meeting up on zoom there will be so many opportunities to learn so thank you very much all of you thanks have a pleasant afternoon take care